Welcome to Massey Dialogue. My name is Natalie DeRosier and I'm the principal of Massey College. I first want to acknowledge that Massey College is built on indigenous lands, the lands of the Yorunwanda and the Seneca, and it is the treaty land of the Mississaugas of the Credit. I want to acknowledge the great privilege that we have to continue to do our work here and discuss a very important issue today, which is governance of the nonprofit sector. I am delighted to have with us uh, our a new member of our community, Robin Cardozo, who published a report on uh, diversity and inclusion in uh, board governance. And I think he's joined today with Matt Fulbrook, and they will be continue to have this discussion with a uh, junior fellow, uh, Cam Kalingo. So I just want to uh, say, great subject. We all need to pay attention to this. And thank you for doing this, Cam. Thank you, Principal De Rosier. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Massey Dialogue on Board Diversity and inclusion in the not-for-profit sector. We are delighted to have you tune in today. My name is Cam Galindo. I am a junior fellow at Massey College, and I will be moderating today's discussion. On top of my fellowship here at Massey College, I'm also an elected public school board trustee in Hamilton. I sit on the board of directors at United Way Halton and Hamilton. I'm also looking forward to graduating this spring with a master of public policy from the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy here at the University of Toronto. Uh, today, I am joined by two distinguished panelists. Uh, Robin Cardozo recently retired after 30 years in executive positions with leading not-for-profit and charitable organizations in Ontario. He is currently engaged in an executive in residence at Rotman School of Management and currently serves on the board of the Ontario Not-for-Profit Network and Soul Pepper Theatre. Uh, prior to his retirement, Robin served as Chief Operating Officer at Sick Kids Foundation and before that served for two years as Chief Executive Officer of the Ontario Trillium Foundation. A decade before that, Robin served as Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for United Way Greater Toronto. Robin was born in Pakistan and was educated in Pakistan and Britain. He was trained as a Chartered Accountant in the 1970s and was elected a Fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants in Ontario in the year 2000. Robin, thank you so much for being here. On the panel today, we also have Matt Fulbrock, who is a board effectiveness researcher, educator, and consultant. Uh, for 20 years, Matt led the Rotman School of Management's governance research as uh, the manager of the Johnson Center for Corporate Governance Innovation and the Clarkson Center for Board Effectiveness. As an independent consultant, Matt has worked in close to 250 boardrooms, helping organizations to maximize their effectiveness through the development and implementation of valuable governance processes, policies, and structures. Matt is the co-academic director of the Board of Dynamics for Executives program offered by Rotman and the Institute of Corporate Directors and is the academic director of the High Performing Board series offered by the Credit Union Executives Society. In 2020, Matt launched a podcast, One Minute Governance, where he explores complex governance issues one minute at a time. Thank you, Matt, for joining us. Happy My to intention be here. is to start our conversation today with a few questions that I prepared. After about 20 minutes or so, uh, we will then moderate uh, an open discussion with our panelists for another 20 minutes. Uh, we will then take questions from the audience and have a Q&A session before turning it back to uh, Robin and Matt for final comments. Uh, to those that are joining us live, feel free to post your questions in the chat, and we'll be using them for our audience Q&A portion of our discussion today. Uh, so to start us off, uh, last year, you both published a paper called a Not-for-Profit Board Diversity and Inclusion. Is it essentially window dressing? Uh, much has been written and spoken about the importance of board diversity in every sector. Uh, now, as it pertains to the not-for-profit, uh, Matt, uh, if you could start us off, uh, what is your take on board diversity and inclusion? Could you tell us a bit about what it means and why it's important? Uh, so that's a, a, a it's a very small question to start us off. No, Cam, thanks for doing this. I, I'm really excited to have this conversation. So, um, I would I think in my 20 or so years in the the general corporate governance space, there's been no more talked about topic than diversity in boardrooms, which mostly for the first 15 or so years that I was working on this was just about 
women in boardrooms and and now the conversation has really expanded beyond that to a lot of different intersecting factors and this is sort of how we and i promise i'll I'll answer your question more directly in a second this is how we ended up in our second paper which just came out a couple months ago looking at equity diversity inclusion and anti-racism and even those are not exhaustive right so when we talk about diversity in boardrooms really what we're talking about is having the the perspectives around the table and that's of course skills and expertise but it's also lived experience it's also cultural diversity and so on because we know that in groups of people a diversity of perspectives leads to better decision and it leads to the inclusion of the the interests of more stakeholders and more groups and individuals so if we think about specifically in the not-for-profit world where we've got organizations where they're their whole raison d'etre is is purpose and to have in many cases social impact this just magnifies the importance of having that diversity of perspectives around the table Mm -hmm. it's interesting because given i think the uh uh, probably the difference in, in age that, that we have between myself and, and, and the two panelists. Um, I've only more recently entered the world of non-for-profit uh, governance and um, uh, at a time when it is very much the norm now to expect uh, equity and diversity and inclusion uh, at that level. Um, so to know that it wasn't always the case and to know that we've come from a place where it wasn't the norm uh, is fascinating to me. Uh, and makes me wonder if this is just the latest, you know, box checking procedure that uh, most uh, not-for-profit organizations uh, may participate in uh, to keep up with the times uh, and with social expectations, uh, or uh, if it's if it's deeper than that, or it can be deeper than that. Uh, but I'll turn to you, Robin, uh, to see if if you'd like to answer the same question, or if you'd like to add anything. Uh, certainly. And Cam, I didn't realize that the, our difference in age was quite that significant. Um, I, I'm just joking. Of course it is. And, and, you know, actually, as Matt was speaking, I was reflecting on the fact that the, there's, there's, there is, in fact, a di- an age difference between Matt and myself, and as well as an experience difference. So my experience is actually a bit different from Matt's. Uh, Matt, I think, has spent mu- uh, has, is re- a real expert in corporate governance, particularly in, 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 in at, at in the corporate sector, uh, whereas I've spent my career of more than 30 years, as, as you mentioned earlier, in the not-for-profit sector. And so I will say that, in fact, in the not-for-profit sector, we were talking about cultural diversity 30 years ago, um, and we were 20 years ago, and we were 10 years ago, uh, which in, in some ways is is depressing, quite frankly, uh, and in some ways is encouraging the fact that, that, that at least the issue is still alive. Um, you know, I remember being at boardroom tables 30 years ago when uh, people were saying we need to figure out how to diversify. Um, and, and, I, and I think it has been an ongoing struggle in part because I think organizations are not sure what diversity means to them. And what, one of the points, and perhaps we'll get into this as we, as we talk, is that I think diversity for different organizations means different things. And just very quickly, I'll, I'll, I'll just give you an example in, in my career. So I started off my, my not-for-profit career at United Way in Toronto. And uh, thir- thir- 30 years ago at United Way in Toronto, uh, the issues were really about gender diversity, as Matt mentioned, and about cultural diversity to recognize the, the cultural diversity of Toronto in those days. Um, after that, I moved to the, to the Ontario Trillium Foundation, which is a provincial agency funded by, by, by the government of Ontario. And diversity there meant different things. Uh, as a provincial agency, uh, we had to think about uh, northern Ontario and southern Ontario. We had to think about urban and rural. Uh, we had to think about uh, indigenous issues in ways that a Toronto-based organization, for better or for worse, doesn't always think about. But indigenous diversity is a much bigger issue in the province than it is in the city of Toronto. Uh, We had to think about francophone issues in a different way, because again, francophone diversity is a different issue in the province of Ontario than it is in the city of Toronto. So my my, my point is simply that uh, it it, it varies from organization to organization. and And I think many are still still trying to figure it out. Uh, The good news is that many are still trying to figure it out uh, and that the issue hasn't gone away. Robin, I love what you're saying. And Cam, if you don't mind me picking up on that and picking up, I think, on something that you said, Cam, is, uh, Robin, I I hope that you'll, you'll agree with me on this. And if you don't, please, please say so. But I think maybe one of the things that has evolved a little bit 
is regardless of how far back you rewind, I'd even say five years, most of these conversations, regardless of the definition of, let's say, diversity, and we're not even touching the equity and inclusion pieces and the anti-racism piece that are much, much more important and complex. Um, when it comes to diversity, really, I think the easiest way to interpret that in a boardroom is as a box to tick, right? Or a number to reach. And to say, we, we have an objective to have X number of fill in the blank in the boardroom is great. It's an, it's a good start. And, and I would argue that quotas, for example, are the only thing so far that has worked systemically on diversifying boardrooms. If you look globally, but it, they, it fails to address the much more difficult and much more meaningful angles of this whole conversation. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, I, I, sorry, go ahead, Cam. No, no, go ahead, Robin. Uh, I was just going to say, Matt, I do agree. And I would just add, uh, so I agree absolutely. And uh, and our first paper, and perhaps we'll get into this as we go through the conversation, makes uh, exactly that point that you just said very strongly, which is that diversity on its own, with the numbers and the quotas, is almost meaningless uh, without a, a parallel and equivalent uh, um, commitment to inclusion. Mm -hmm. So can I ask then, uh, before we get to the first paper uh, and what some of the findings might have been from that, um, can we? Can I get you both to speak to then what has brought us to where we're at now with board diversity and inclusion? What were the drivers that have really uh, led to uh, such a strong focus in the not-for-profit sector? Um, I suspect, um, you know, is there a role for government to play? Did government play a role? Has it played a role? Um, or was it simply the stakeholders uh, responsible for funding these organizations that um, played a role in really bringing us to where we are today? I'm, I'm curious if, if either of you have any uh, thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a very good question. And, and I would say there probably have been a number of drivers. Uh, it definitely is more prominent as, a, as an issue uh, today than in the not-for-profit sector than it was 10 years ago. Um, I'd like to think, I, I believe funders played an issue, both government funders and foundation funders and private funders. Um, I, I, as you say, as you suggest, Cam, I think organizations themselves are realizing that if we're going to serve a community that is very diverse, it doesn't make sense to have a board that is not diverse. Uh, I, I talk in the paper about a, a, a hospital board that I joined some years ago where I was the first person of color, um, and yet the hospital in in down, downtownish Toronto uh, served, a, as you might expect, a very very diverse patient uh, patient group, uh, and it hadn't been an issue in, 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 from the board's perspective at that time. But I think it would it would much be a, a, maybe more of an issue today. And the last point I'd make on this is that I, I think um, I, I think many groups are also. Uh, waking up and demanding uh, representation, demanding a place at the table appropriately um, when you have an organization that claims uh, to funders that they're serving, let's say, the black community or the indigenous community or the LGBT community or what have you. And, uh, and, and funders are saying, well, OK, um, does your board represent that? So, so I, th I think there have been a number of factors that have influenced the, uh, the, the, the growth of the issue. I, I would ag completely agree. I think that the number of factors increases all the time. I, I think one of the ones that I've noticed significantly, and I, I'd say that there's almost been like a linear evolution on this one is the, I'll put, I'll frame it as a positive. The improvement in the availability of good language and vocabulary and so on that's accessible to anybody where we can now talk about these things more in a more articulate way together without feeling like we have no idea what to say. And so we get into a conversation in a boardroom and I think this is whether it's not for profit or private sector or whatever, when somebody wants to have a conversation about equity, diversity, and inclusion in the boardroom, uh, and on average, the folks around the room are much better able to engage in a conversation without it just being boiled down to, oh, well, what's the business case, which is what we used to talk about 15 years ago. Instead, it's 
a lot of different things. How are we going to make sure that we are taking into consideration the interests of a broad group of stakeholders? Exactly which groups of people do we feel are underrepresented in this room and how might, how might we access them and engage them and, and so on and so on. So the, the, the willingness, I think, in, to have these conversations is in part influenced by the fact that there's a general level of comfort in having the conversations in the first place. And I think another one is there's a in the not for profit world, at least in my experience, there's a little bit less of an emphasis put on only whether the person we're the people we want in the boardroom can bring us the most dollars, right? Because that that of course, when you're just looking at the people with the highest net worth, you're fishing in a much smaller pond demographically, necessarily speaking. So I think that those are two additional factors that are influencing this. Um, if I could jump in, uh, sorry, sorry, Cam, you're, you're going to have to get used to the fact that Matt and I somehow continue sometimes agree and disagree with certain aspects of what each other say. So um, I wanted to agree and disagree with a little bit of, 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 of what Matt said there. Um, I, I think there is, to some extent, a growing comfort in talking about some of these issues at the table. Um, I would say, though, that that still is has a long way to go. Um, some of the recent language, as, and, and I think language has a lot to do with it, and you alluded to language earlier, Matt. Um, I was in a boardroom session uh, not that long ago, but there was an education session for the board, and and the, the, the facilitator was using language like um, white privilege uh, and, and, and even white supremacy. Uh, and, and, and I would say that there was a very mixed level of comfort to, uh, to some of the terminology being used. Um, so I, I guess my point is that I, I, I don't want to in any way um, dismiss the importance of using strong language to make a clear point. Um, I think at the same time, there, needs, there perhaps needs to be at many tables an understanding that people are, are going to be at different speeds coming up to speed with some of that language. And one last point I'll make on that, and I think that I think I am agreeing with you on the, at, at this point, is that, that, that there certainly are boards in the not-for-profit sector that have for a long time uh, been dominated by donors uh, who are, have deep pockets, who come from white uh, backgrounds and have been doing very, very good job as board members, have been doing the best they possibly can, have been very generous with, with, with in terms of their, of, of their personal donations. Uh, and then ask, I think in many cases with good curiosity perhaps, um, am I, and I'm just quoting here, so am I being told that I'm not, no longer needed? Is that what you're trying to tell me? And I think we, ha and as part of that dialogue, we have to figure out that the answer is not that the long-term supporters are no longer needed, but there has to be a way, we need to find a way to, to bring in more people into the tent. And actually, and, and again, I, I still want to get into the first report at some point, but uh, it brings up a good point around what the future of the not-for-profit sector looks like given that the financial stability uh, and traditional sources of funding uh, are becoming less reliable over time, uh, particularly with a new generation of, of young people who uh, are not making as much money as, our, as previous generations or having a harder time uh, putting food on the table who are suffering the consequences of inflation and therefore uh, have less money in their pockets to contribute to not-for-profit organizations. So uh, I am noticing a broader uh, concern and shift within the not-for-profit sector around uh, what the future uh, of, of funding sources will be like. And uh, again, when we consider what the role of government will be, will government have to step in uh, to fill the gaps that the not-for-profit sector has traditionally filled where government uh, has failed, frankly. Um, it is something that, that comes to mind. I'm not sure if either of you have any thoughts on that, uh, but um, maybe I'll turn to you, Robin, first, if, if you wouldn't mind answering that one. I think it's a really, really good and, and, and timely question, Cam. And I, I, I would, uh, and there is no easy answer. I, I would only say that uh, in my observation, particularly during the years that I was at the Ontario Trillium Foundation, had, had the privilege of seeing a, a very large number of not-for-profit organizations across the province. I would say that the most innovative ones were 
working hard to diversify their sources of revenue. Um, so where you had government revenue, you, you have philanthropy, uh, but but you also lo look for ways of, of generating earned revenue uh, through fees or, or selling services and so on. And, and I know that's easy to say, and it isn't necessarily easy for every organization, uh, but certainly a number of innovative organizations were looking for those opportunities. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I don't. I think Robin, I have little to uh, to add other than I, I completely agree with you. And I think there's a, there's a thing that happens in boardrooms frequently, where we see a new uh, systemic risk that's evolving, and we have a tendency to mostly talk about how is this going to affect us, which is of course an important question. But I think in general, in my experience the organizations that tend to come out better are the ones who ask in addition, okay, so how are we going to continue to be a force for positive change in the world as we go along this new journey that has this evolving risk on it, right? So I think it's really important to, for organizations, and Robin, you, you I think, articulated it well, Innovation can seem like a really intimidating word, and it, it doesn't necessarily have to come along with a, a difficult or a wholesale transformation. But you have to, as an organization, look at these large systemic changes and wonder how you're going to continue to succeed and approach those questions with a deep curiosity instead of just cynicism or fear. Mm hmm. Uh, so I'm wondering, in the paper that you both published last year uh, on not-for-profit board diversity and inclusion, uh, Matt, maybe I could turn to you uh, with this question. Uh, what were some of the major findings in that report? Oh, there's so it was such a big paper. I think, uh, you know, I'm going to be really, really brief on this because, Robin, I think you and I and I maybe can both touch on a couple of points each. But it's still I, I'll encourage everybody who's who's watching to have a, a look at the papers. I believe at some point we'll share the links to the papers so you can read them because they are quite deep and quite cool. Um, so one of them, the most important one, which Robin already very directly alluded to is, you know, when we examined all these different organizations and had very deep conversations with lots of different board members and board chairs and executive directors, uh, the, the most striking theme is any time that you focus on diversity in a vacuum, it doesn't really accomplish much, right? And, and then the focus on inclusion, and you start realizing, okay, well, this inclusion is the superpower that activates diversity, and it's extremely difficult, and it's not a box to tick, right? Inclusion isn't something you say, we did it. It's, it's more a, okay, what are the, the ways that we can approach creating the conditions for everyone in this organization, and especially in this boardroom, to thrive? And the, you know, the other piece I think that, that I took away from it was that we talked to all these organizations that were so different from each other. Each one had different stories. Each one had different approaches. And it, it reinforced, I've always, not always, I've very, for a long time said, when it comes to governance, there's no such thing as best practice. Uh, the, the approaches that are going to be effective for one organization are different from what will work in another organization. And this was just a really interesting reinforcement of that, where every story we hear about success or missteps or whatever it is, every organization is on its own path and its own journey. That doesn't mean they can't learn from each other, but it does mean that you can't sort of copy and paste from one organization to another. So I, I'm being very high level because there's so much to say, but Robin, maybe you can add what you felt we, we learned. So I agree that, that there was a lot in it. And maybe I'll just touch on one, one theme, just as you touched on, 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 on one theme, Matt. Um, and I think it's the, the theme I'll touch on is, is the importance of personalized onboarding of, of or orienting new board members. Uh, for the longest time in the, in the not-for-profit sector, uh, uh, by and large, there was a one-size-fits-all approach to onboarding new members. You'd have a half-day workshop and you'd give them the board manual and you'd say, here are the bylaws and here are the financial statements and the, here's the org chart and uh, if you have any questions, this is who to call kind of thing. Um, and I think what we learned as we talked to boards and talked to board mem uh, to 
board members from all backgrounds uh, was that the one size fits all onboarding isn't really fair to anybody because everyone comes onto a board with a diff, hopefully comes onto a board with a different experience, different background, different education, and has different things to offer the organization. Uh, and that it's really valuable uh, to orient, to onboard uh, new board members individually so as to, so that you can, uh, we can work together uh, that the board member feels part of the board, feels part of the organization, knows how she or he can contribute to the organization. Uh, and, 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 and there's also a clear learning path because everyone has a different learning path. Uh, I'll just say one more thing on this. That there's sometimes an assumption that people from, let's say, diverse backgrounds, for want of a better term, uh, need more education perhaps or need more orientation or maybe they haven't had as much experience. Um, and I would say that that is not necessarily the case. Quite often, I've been on boards where you've got someone who's got who's, who comes in with great uh, corporate C-suite background, has been on corporate boards, and there's an assumption that they don't need onboarding. Wrong. Uh, they need uh, they, they need to learn about the about the services. They need to learn about the needs in the community. Uh, they need to learn about diversity of the community. All things that someone with less board experience, but more lived experience brings onto the board naturally. So everyone needs different kinds of onboarding uh, and, and I believe just needs to be personalized. I, I love what you're saying, Robin. I, I, there's a rabbit hole I really wanna dive into, but I won't, but I will add one piece because I think it's, it's an important element of that, that paper that builds on what you're saying, which is we also heard stories from folks from underrepresented communities who, um, they, th there was a real variance in terms of how interested they were in uh, being a voice for their community, right? And so understanding and having a shared understanding between the board and the recruit as far as what are the expectations when these people come in the room, right? Are they, uh, some of them don't shy, didn't shy away at all from, from say tokenism, where, where others said, I don't wanna be in a room where I'm expected to be that person. And so there's a really big variance in terms of, of people's willingness to play certain roles in the boardroom and during the onboarding process, or hopefully even before during the interview process, is an opportunity that you can take with the people you're interested in bringing onto your board to establish a shared idea of what the expectations are. It's certainly a good point, actually, that you just made there, Matt, um, because I've often found myself uh, sitting at decision-making tables as one of the only people of color, only to realize that although my intention was to come and work on these files, given whatever education or employment or work experience that I have, uh, I would often be uh, required to actually be the advocate for uh, the equity and inclusion file, um, which, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to, to come with the mindset of, of doing that. It's another thing to uh, be required to do that because of whatever void or gap is missing at, at the board table. Um, and I think it's a shared experience a lot of people uh, face uh, in board governance. Uh, but um, so I found that very interesting. Um, so, so the work from your first report uh, ended up uh, informing uh, your new report uh, titled uh, From Window Dressing to Real Change, success stories from boards on a journey to diversity and inclusion. And that came out, I believe it was earlier this year. Uh, what were some of the more interesting examples in that report that stand out to you? Robin, why don't you go? Um, sure. So uh, the uh, f thanks, Matt. Uh, thanks, Cam. Uh, so I, I think the reason we uh, that Matt and I felt we needed to do a second report was that uh, the first report got a lot of really, really positive reaction, but that there were a couple of themes in terms of the feedback and uh, that, that we were getting from, 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 the, from the webinars and the, and, and the work group sessions that we had. Um, one was the continuing question about, uh, is, is it difficult to find candidates? We're finding it difficult to find candidates for our board, uh, which we deliberately stayed away from in the, in the first uh, paper because we thought so much had been said already said. So we were surprised at that question. And uh, and the second question uh, was people were looking for more and more specific practical examples. Uh, people were not, 
uh, we often heard that people saying that, that there's lots of stuff written that has has complicated language and complicated concepts. Uh, could we just get some practical how tos from organizations that 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 have that are on the journey? Uh, so Matt and I put our heads together and we and we decided to interview six organizations in depth. Uh, they're all organizations that are on the journey. Uh, and have had some successes and all would be the first to say we still have a long way to go um so i'll, I'll just mention uh, so again we actually had in this case 10 uh, themes that, that we came out with uh, after the six organizations we interviewed and I'll, just, I'll talk about one um and and it was almost like we were hit on the head with this uh that on the one hand we kept hearing uh from not not necessarily these organizations but in the community as a whole we keep hearing from organizations saying we find it difficult to find candidates we're, we're looking for diversity uh we don't find quote unquote qualified candidates quote unquote we don't find experienced candidates for the board um yet at the same time on the other side we heard from candidates saying we're qualified, we're experienced, we, we understand this field. We're, we're not getting calls, we're not getting our calls returned, we're not getting interviewed for these positions. And what was most interesting on this was that we, we, we talked to four search consultants who work deeply in this field, helping boards find candidates of, of all descriptions and backgrounds and so on. And all the four search consultants said there are candidates out there. There's lots of candidates out there. Sometimes one just has to look in different places. Maybe you don't always look in the C-suites of corporations or on the C-suites of the largest not-for-profits. Maybe you just broaden your search, broaden your mind, look for, look for candidates who, who might, at first glance, look uh, uh, have a slightly different resume, but at the same time have a huge amount to offer on the board. So that, that, that to us was, was real, that gap what well, was a really interesting learning. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Robin. Yeah, I mean, there's so again, there's so many thoughts. It's such a big and and uh, and broad paper. I so I think again, I, I relearned a lesson, and I'll give an example of one of the organizations in a second. But I relearned the theme that everyone's on a different path, right? And again, there's a lot to learn from each other. But every organization that we spoke with had different processes, different definitions of the challenges they were facing, different approaches they were taking to try to address these issues, and different results of those conversations that led to unique structures or processes or practices or whatever it is. So every single organization, and this is why it's, I think, a really impactful paper. If you read through, you're reading through six organizations who've had success on this journey, which is equity, diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism in boardrooms. And every single one of them is doing something really cool, but really different from each other. And one organization that I want to highlight, partly because so we, we the order of the organizations in the paper is alphabetical, but I think it was really fortunate that Anishinaabe Health Foundation was the first story featured uh, alphabetically because it was kind of this cool capsule of a lot of the different themes that, that came through the paper. So Anishinaabe Health Foundation is, uh, they provide funding to Anishinaabe Health Toronto, which has a mission to improve the well-being of Indigenous peoples in Toronto through both traditional Indigenous and Western approaches. And so they, they had themes in their conversation about systemic racism, the important difference between equity and equality. Uh, they had stories about broad failures around inclusion and, and so on. And the, the foundation and its leaders and its community, they showed that these themes are, in fact, in a lot of cases, way more pronounced for Indigenous people. And so this was a really interesting place to start the paper, because what it does is it sets the themes and the tone that all these other organizations where some of these themes have maybe different nuances, they still carry through. And so I, I really loved that we had this opportunity to both speak with them and feature them. And, and, and they were the first ones in the paper. Mm -hmm. Was there an organization, Robin, that comes to mind that illustrates the progress that you saw in the report? 
Well, um, all, I would say that all six organizations that we featured uh, have uh, have illustrated the progress in in, in in one way or another. And maybe I'll, I'll, I'm happy to touch on uh, on, on on one or two. Uh, the, the the Toronto Foundation that uh, some people may may remember they used to be called the Toronto Community Foundation that they're now called the Toronto Foundation um, had a really good uh, it was an organization that traditionally used. Uh, so, so, so the Toronto Foundation essentially uh, handles uh, investment, philanthropic investment funds of, of donors, where, where the donor makes a contribution of capital to, to Toronto Foundation. And then over time, that capital will be used to make philanthropic uh, donations to, uh, to organizations across the community. And, and for, for the longest time, they, the, the, the organization really thought of themselves as being represent, that they needed to represent their donors. Uh, and the donor community, not surprisingly, was uh, sort of old Toronto money. Um, and they came to realize over time that it was really valuable to think of themselves as being representative of the community that they're serving, uh, which is really the, 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 the charitable organizations uh, across the city and indeed across the country. Uh, and so they've been on, on, on a rapid growth of diversification. One interesting uh, feature that, that they introduced in from a board governance perspective was to um, create something called the BIPOC Board Caucus, where uh, all the members of the board who identify themselves as being members of BIPOC communities, so Black, Indigenous, or people of color, um, meet periodically to advise uh, the, the chair and the CEO uh, on strategy and, 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 and board board issues uh, from a perspective of their own lived and uh, and previous experiences. I, I thought this was very brave because I must admit when I first when they first told us this, my first reaction was, uh, is this something that runs the risk of creating a silo? You're, you're putting the people who are people of color into this special committee. Uh, it, um, are, are you risking uh, sort of siloing their, their issues? And in fact, both the members of the committee and the CEO and 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 the and the uh, uh, the, the board chair all said, in fact, it's it, it's very much the opposite. The um, the uh, it, it's a committee of very engaged and thoughtful people uh, who 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 get to uh, get to express opinions and provide input on every issue of strategic importance to the organization uh, before it gets to the full board even. So they're, so they're, they're really weighing in, in, in um, at, at critical points um, in the development. So I thought, and, and that was a, a really interesting um, innovation that, 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 that they had. And uh, they've been on the, their board has been diversifying. If you, if you take a look at their board today, compared to where the board was 10 years ago, uh, they've come a long way and they and they plan to go further still. So I could I could talk about any one of the six organizations, but I just uh, highlighted that one because that their, their, their journey has been so interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's certainly things to learn from those organizations as well that other uh, non for profits can can take away and, and, and learn from. Um, I'll remind viewers that we will be getting to the audience questions soon, so feel free to pose any questions you may have in the chat uh, for Q and A. Uh, and I'll turn it back to the panelists uh, for another question. Um, your report does have an optimistic tone, um, given that you researched six success stories. Uh, but uh, what would you say uh, to organizations and people within the sector whose experience isn't as positive? How, how would you suggest they navigate uh, some of those experiences? And I'll turn uh, maybe to uh, Robin for that one first. Sure, happy to take a stab at it. So that uh, the, there is no magic answer. There is no this. There is no um, uh, toolbox to, that says this is the way you should go about it. Because uh, as Matt mentioned earlier, every organization is different. Uh, every organization has a different board culture uh, and and is at a diff different point in the journey. Uh, that said, I think a couple of things that we picked up from, uh, I'll just go back to some of these examples that of organizations we talked to. Uh, one is that the, uh, it, it can sometimes seem enormous. It can sometimes feel from a board governance point of view that uh, we're never going to, the, the, there's so much change to to be made that that we're never going to get it done. It's a bit like climate change in a way, you know, where, where, where if you look at it from one perspective, the issues are so big uh, that, that you kind of wonder in this case at the organizational level, um, 
um, how are you going to affect that? And I think what we heard from some of our organizations was that you just need to start somewhere. Uh, and maybe a year later, you might feel, I wish we had started somewhere else, but at least you will have made progress. So wh whether it's an issue of running board education sessions, whether it's an issue of board and management working together to identify top priorities, uh, whether it's uh, identifying some uh, uh, numeric objectives to get to um, at mm -hmm. Pepper Theatre, one of the, uh, you mentioned earlier, Canva, that I'm on the board of Pepper. We, we, we set a target that, 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 of, 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 that, that, that where we want that, that within three years, we, we want to be at 40% uh, BIPOC representation on the board. And, and just setting that uh, three years from now, you know, one year in and we're, we're already over 30%. Um, so having, um, having numeric goals uh, sometimes helps. So my, my point is that it's sometimes helpful to that you have to start somewhere um, and, and you learn as you go along. And I, I'll make one more point and, and, and that's this is not work that can be done on the side of someone's desk uh, that uh, where one might think, um, oh yes, let's let's think about uh, what we need to present to the board this month kind of thing. Uh, at, at management level, ideally it needs to be part of someone's job. Uh, it, in a larger organization, it might be their whole job, and in a smaller organization, it might be part of their job, but clearly defined as part of their objectives. Similarly, at the board, it, it, it needs to be, there needs to be clear responsibility. Uh, again, just to use my Soul Pepper example, I, will, I already mentioned the, uh, the uh, Toronto Foundation example uh, of their BIPOC caucus. Uh, a variation of that at, at Soul Pepper is that we have two members of the board who are the uh, uh, DE, um, EDI are uh, champions, which means that th part of their role is to continue to uh, nudge the board uh, to make sure that when some whatever the issue that comes to the board, whether it's on the budget or the strategic plan or a marketing plan, uh, to ask questions, uh, remind us about asking questions from an EDI perspective. So, uh, so my, I guess my point is to is that it's, it's useful to to pick some somewhere to start not worry initially about getting everything done, uh, but be able to identify that progress is being made year over year over year. Mm -hmm. I, these are all really, really good insights, Robin. I don't know that I could be as insightful or, or articulate as that, but I, I, I do want to share something that's a theme I see in most boardrooms. When there's... Uh, uh, you're asking about a less than positive experience that folks, the some people in boardrooms might have. And I, in my experience, the people who get most frustrated in boardrooms are the people who really want something better to happen. And they're running up against the rest of the room who sort of sees the job of a board as being mostly compliance. And what I mean is, you know, organizational governance is not compliance. Compliance is stuff you have to do. I prefer to to think of organizational governance as just the way that decisions happen and get made inside the organization, which means that good governance is let's create the conditions where good decisions can happen, effective decisions can happen. And of course, compliance is a, is a piece of what an organization has to do. But one of the ways that I've found it useful to start conversations and get that first few steps happening inside boardrooms that are reluctant to change. And I don't just mean they're reluctant to change because they don't believe in equity, diversity, inclusion, and so on. It's that they don't, the boardrooms are, are places filled with inertia usually. So it can be helpful to, to just open with a little bit of curiosity, right? And, and that can be really simple and it can be introducing some of the pieces that Robin just described and say, could we spend five minutes at our next board meeting, having a conversation about X. Everyone can maybe come having thought about this question, so we're not putting anyone on the spot. And just start the conversation, take really small steps, and you'll start seeing that that people aren't, it's not that they don't want to improve, it's not that they don't want to change usually, it's that the this tendency to want to tick a lot, well, you have to tick a lot of boxes in a boardroom. There's a lot of things that you have to do. Uh, the finding time and finding enthusiasm to add those additional, really important, creative, curious elements. I think that it, you, that 
that board members can play a really important role if they're frustrated in trying to introduce easy ways to start those conversations. But it's I'm, I'm making it sound simpler than it is. It's extremely hard, especially when you're the odd person out. Yeah, as a follow-up, Matt, uh, is it enough then to have a focus on diversity and inclusion at the board level, uh, or uh, does more need to be done uh, at an institution, if not organizational level, uh, to address this. Um, there are some that would argue that this broader shift towards diversity and inclusion in the not-for-profit sector is just a form of tokenism. Um, and in many cases, that is the case. Uh, but are there ways that organizations can minimize tokenism uh, and pay tribute and, and you know, find value in, in diversity and inclusion? Right. Okay. No, this is this is a huge question and one that we'll never fully explore it during this conversation. And I'm I, I'm more eager to hear Robin's perspectives than to share my own. But my my perspective is on the first piece of it. Of course, it has to be organization wide. Um, right. If there's not buy in throughout the organization, then it's extremely difficult to get anything happening. That said, the board is the top decision making authority in the organization. They're the ones with their butts on the line and they need to find ways to lead. And that doesn't mean that they're not also learning and following cues from the executive director and staff and so on. But ultimately, it's the board's responsibility and they are accountable for setting this tone and making sure that the pieces are in place to make it happen. And if they're not, then making change. Um, with respect to the tokenism piece, I think we've covered some of the important stuff already, right? Which is making sure we have shared sets of expectations, making sure that the onboarding experience is tailored to the needs of each individual person. I loved Robin's point that you'll get a, a seasoned CEO in the boardroom and that doesn't mean that they're an effective director. One of the things that I often hear from boardrooms is they'll say, look, we really need a lawyer in the room and that's fine. Great. It can be really, really useful to have legal expertise in the room, but being a lawyer doesn't make somebody a good director. And so setting an individual person up, regardless of their professional background or their expertise or their experience, setting them up so they can be successful in the boardroom is a really big, I think, piece of taking the conversation away from box ticking tokenism and toward how do we make sure that we're including this person thoughtfully, meaningfully, and engaging them in the process of making good decisions for the organization. Mm -hmm. Robin, what are your thoughts? It, it, it's a great question, Cam, and I, I, I really liked Matt's, uh, Matt's answer there. Um, Maybe if I could just briefly tie this issue of tokenism back to the point that you made earlier, Cam, uh, about sometimes being a, a, as the only person of color or, or the only person who's a, clearly a minority being expected almost to be the person carrying the uh, EDI question or, or so on. And that, that's a really, really good uh question and, and and one that is a uh i i've been in that situation myself sometimes it sounds like you have cam um and, and i suspect many uh me, it, it, that, that that it is a common experience um I, I would just make a couple of observations and i apologize if if if, if, if these sound um pollyanna ish because uh, i don't necessarily because this is a very heavy subject um Sometimes I think that happens because people simply don't know better. It's it, it's it's that they it's not that they think uh, to uh, that that they're acting as if as if there's a uh, with a tokenistic approach, but but it's that they they just don't necessarily know better. Um, so one way sometimes is, is to look for allies uh, at the table who who, who can help to who can help to speak on the issues and 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 the way to look for allies perhaps is not necessarily in the moment at the table uh but it it's often having a coffee after a meeting or or or, or with, with, with with one or two board members or having a phone call with with, with one or two people who, who one thinks might be like-minded uh to, to test them out and see if, if, if they're willing to carry some of the load um, on, on some of these issues. Um, and I, I will say that personally, although I, I, I again, I, you know, I think both Matt and I are, are trying hard here not to make these, our answers sound simplistic or, or, or so on. But, but, but I will say that I have sometimes had success with finding allies in surprising places. 
where someone who might have been quiet at the boardroom table um, in a conversation after and then in subsequent board meetings has been willing to speak up and not to leave me as the uh, as the person as the only person uh, speaking out on the uh, on the diversity issue uh, or, or the only person we've been looked at uh, um, as the token. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that fully answers the, your question, uh, Cam, but uh, it, but it, mm -hmm. it, it is an important one. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate the response. I think uh, the one note I'll make on that is that uh, it's often not enough to focus on diversity and inclusion at the uh, board governance level. Uh, just because a board may appear representative of the community that they serve, uh, I think looking at uh, staffing and, and the uh, organization as a whole uh, is important too because they're the ones on the front lines that are actually doing the work um, and sometimes it can be difficult to uh, make sure that the employment uh, hiring practices much you know we talk about the recruitment practices for board members but uh, sometimes we forget that uh, we also need to look at the, um, the hiring practices uh, in the not-for-profit sector uh, to make sure that we're hiring individuals and to make sure that our organization is representative of the community that that uh, we're serving and you know, part of that uh, sometimes requires uh, an equity audit uh, to take place across the organization not just at the governance level uh, so i think that's the one note that i'll make but uh, i do see that we have a question in the chat uh, and i am noticing that we're already getting close to uh, the five o'clock mark there but uh, this question is from the canadian business history association uh, Not-for-profits are privileged uh, incorporated entities that are tax exempt. Uh, why doesn't government mandate diversity, equity, inclusion before they receive this privilege in their bylaws, for example? Um, I'll, maybe I'll turn to uh, Matt for, for this question to start us off and then Robin, if, if, if you could respond after. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so I, it's a really cool question, and and um, I'm going to admit up front that I'm not a hunt, I'm not sure how to mandate inclusion and equity. So let's start with diversity because it's a little bit easier. And I, I, there, I'm not saying there's not a way. I just I don't know of it. And so I, I I would and I think I mentioned this earlier. If we look at government mandates or, or regulator mandates around diversity, um, there are examples globally. This has mostly only been around women up until recently, the NASDAQ has one that's a little bit more in, uh, inclusive of different groups, but they're the only external factor that has actually worked at making sure that an entire system of organizations has X number of women on board. So quotas work. There's a, a challenge, however, which is if we think of all the potentially intersecting demographic characteristics and traits and factors that we might want to consider as far as diversity and representation in boardrooms. There are too many t thousands, tens of thousands of them that the definition of diversity is extremely difficult to boil down into a boardroom of 10 or 12 people. And how do we know that we've hit the, the bullseye for this organization? I, I'm just not sure. I, I think it, that there are better ways to do it than what we've seen in a lot of cases. But so I'm saying on the one hand, yes, quotas work. I think they're, they're a really good idea, but I'm not sure how to solve the problem of creating a quota that ensures rep equity and, and inclusion. It's, it's just, it's very difficult. And it, the, I'm not sure, maybe someone else has better ideas than me. Hmm. Robin, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I, I agree with Matt. I think uh, the, the question is a good one and an important one. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not sure off the top how, um, uh, if mandating a quota, for example, would would, would address uh, the, the concern because it, it would be, uh, it, it might be easy to uh, to, uh, to achieve a quota in, in, in ways that are less than constructive. Um, that said, uh, there certainly is an, is, uh, is an effort that I think uh, Senator Ratna Omidvar, a uh, member of the Senate who's been leading a, a lot of issues affecting uh, both uh, immigrant communities as well as the not-for-profit sector, uh, has been lobbying the CRA to, to just add a simple question to the CRA return uh, to, uh, to ask uh, board, uh, each organization to report on an annual basis what the uh, what the diversity of their board is within certain categories. Uh, I think just self-reporting, as has been found in parts of uh, of, of corporate Canada, uh, sometimes just uh, enforcing self-reporting uh, does tend to uh, improve behavior. 
So that might be a place to start anyway. Mm -hmm. Working on the board at United Way, I know that one of the biggest challenges that non-for-profit organizations face is the fact that uh, they are often using up resources that could be used for programming and the work that they're doing in the community, uh, but for reporting and following up with, um, you know, mandated uh, uh, statistics or questions that uh, you know, sources of funding uh, require, particularly from government. Uh, and that often carries an expense. So I, I think uh, you know, there, there would always be hesitation there too. Uh, the more accountability measures that we introduce, well, the less of an impact an organization can have on the community because of that takes time, that takes money. Um, so I can see that being one of the challenges there. Um, I think um, I, I am noticing as well that we have another question in the chat here. Um, it says, why, this is from Andrew. It says, why is calendar age taboo? Uh, not to deal with as a diversity issue. Um, I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I fully understand the question, um, but maybe um, Robin, uh, if, if you are you interpreting this in a way that uh, you might be able to offer a response? Yeah, I, I think the way I'm interpreting it is uh, shouldn't uh, age, uh, whether uh, uh, above a certain age or below a certain age, uh, be a uh, consideration uh, for diversity. Now, I'd say that I have encountered, or and I've certainly personally been involved in boards that have, for example, uh, tried to diversify age-wise by bringing on younger people. Um, and uh, so, so I, I, I would say it should not be a taboo issue. And um, I think it comes back to what is the d definition of diversity for the organization, one of the points I was making much earlier. Um, and to some degree, uh, it depends on, on, on who the client group is. Uh, or who you're serving, and 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 if you, as an organization you're serving a, a, an age diverse group, uh, then I would agree absolutely. Age diversity should be uh, one one of the considerations for uh, for the board. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Robin, and and thanks, Andrew, for the question. I'm glad that you're here. Um, this is a, it's an interesting one because historically, uh, boards uh, historically over the span that I've been studying the the age of board members and I, this is only slightly different in the not for profit world is kind of clustered within a sort of twenty year age range, um, and so there has basically never been much age diversity that I'm aware of in boardrooms, and I I definitely think that there's more conversation around this. And there's a lot of interesting reluctance to bring younger people into boardrooms because we're worried about their lack of experience and so on. Uh, but there's also a worry that we're worried about bringing older people into boardrooms because there's, in some cases, I think there's a sense that they're not going to have up-to-date knowledge or whatever it is. And I think that the reason why this is an important question is that, well, of course we can't paint everybody with the same brush just based on their, their calendar age. So. Uh, it's a really interesting and important element of this. It's one of many intersecting factors here and, and one that boards, I don't think, have done a great job at having meaningful conversations about, in my opinion. You know, aside from the benefits of youth engagement at the uh, governance and board level, I have seen uh, some uh, not-for-profits organization uh, put a focus on uh, bringing in young people uh, and engaging them in discussion uh, for the sake, if not financially uh, to uh, secure a future base of donors uh, down the road uh, and to uh, essentially make it easier to uh, have this newer generation understand the work that an organization does so that uh, when the time comes that they have sufficient income, they could you know, perhaps give back to the community uh, or at least be inspired to, to donate. Uh, but that's just another lens, I, I think, uh, when it comes to involving young people uh, in the process. Uh, I am mindful of time here, and unfortunately, I don't see any other questions in the comments there, but I do want to turn to each of the panelists to offer some final comments. Um, Robin, perhaps I'll start with you. Uh, would you like to offer any final comments based on today's discussion? Uh, just very quickly, thank you for this opportunity to talk about this important subject. Uh, having worked in the field for a, a long time and uh, and also having had the privilege of working with Matt on these two research papers, uh, I, I would say that overall I feel encouraged that, that progress is being made. Uh, I, I'm aware that, that, that the sector, the not-for-profit sector, still has a long way to go. Um, and I would just reiterate uh, one point that I made earlier in discussion, which is that the while the overall subject, the theme, may seem hugely intimidating and huge and big. Uh, what we heard from a number, of, a number of our organizations was simply start somewhere. 
Thank you. And, and mm -hmm. thank you to you, Cam. You did, you've done a great job as facilitator. It's been a pleasure working with you. No, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matt, what are your thoughts? Yeah, thanks. And thank you, Cam. And thank you, Robin. It's always such a treat to talk with you. Um, I, and really, I'm just going to take what Robin said and and add a little bit of, of a different or an additional perspective, which is we've got a, a paper here. If people are really struggling to figure out where to start, this paper has illustrations of six organizations, again, that are all doing really different things. So if you want a spark of inspiration, it's it's an easy read. There's lots of insight there. There might be one little thing in there that you say, I think this is really cool. It's not perfect for our organization, but it's given me an idea. And that I think was the, the, the inspiration behind the paper for us was to say, okay, well, look, let's take what we wrote last year and try to add some really practical real world stuff. And so I, I'm pretty confident that there's some spark of inspiration in there for just about any organization if you're struggling to figure out where to start your journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Uh, this discussion has certainly been very uh, insightful uh, and I'm actually feeling inspired. I, I do want to take an opportunity to thank uh, our panelists for joining us today and for sharing their thoughtful insight and expertise on this topic. Uh, Matt, Robin, thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you for all the work that you do on this topic. Uh, if folks are interested in learning more about this topic, I believe a couple of links uh, is, are being posted in the chat uh, to the two papers that we discussed today. Uh, I also want to take an opportunity to thank Massey College, uh, Principal De Rosier, uh, Alyssa Ginsberg, and everyone behind the scenes that helped make all this possible, including, of course, our technical director, uh, Joe Costa. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Uh, that's a wrap.